everyone. Uh, this is my second episode of the web series, um, A Positive Response. We're gonna do the second episode in English. I will be editing and putting subtitles in Turkish for my Turkish audience. My second episode's guest is Frederica Tevenbring, and she is going to be talking about prehistoric woman and modern fantasies. And why Frederica is uh, great to talk about this subject matter, obviously, is that she is an intellectual historian and former archeologist, specialized in questions of history of archeology span and mythology. And her research focuses on questions of gender and heritage. Um, what I love straight off the bat about this and having known um, Frederica is that uh, she doesn't just bring archaeology and history necessarily from an academic standpoint to the table, but she really brings in kind of where we are at today in the world and looking at the past to kind of answer some of those questions, which I think is extremely fascinating. Go ahead, Fred. Thank you, Valens. I hope, I hope I'll do that lovely introduction justice, but um, yeah, so so I'll ask Mel to say that I'm an intellectual historian and an archaeologist. So I work with um, ancient mythology and ancient history. But what I'm interested in, in particular, how we always construct the past a little because of answering to our needs in the present. And one thing that I'm very interested in, in both gender question and nationality. So roughly, I'll give you a, like a rough timeline the history of the world <laughs> uh, in the late 18th century and especially in the 19th century is that a lot of nation states come into being so that is to say and it's really remarkable if you think how young many countries are like of course the place has been there forever and traditions have been there for for a long time but thinking of yourself as a nation that we create an identity which is particularly in the 19th century and early 20th century and a lot of what happens then is to look backwards to look especially to antiquity and to see think of the past as a heritage so us being the people with the same ancestors the people carrying the same traditions um, and that also it's, it's around this time that also history starts being studied as a historical discipline archaeology starts to be done not just digging around to find beautiful things but actually digging systematically to find out what actually happened to our ancestors so a lot of things that we think of history as something very old, which in one sense it is, that history as a discipline, as something we do at universities, is not so old. What happened in this time in 19th century, especially in Europe, is particularly like Greece and Rome, ancient Greece and ancient Rome becomes uh, very important. And you can think about it, it, it still has this very loaded uh, role in, uh, in our culture. So if you think, if you go to a museum, you'll find tons of artworks depicting Greek gods and Greek, uh, Greek myths, uh, our banks, our museum, they all look like Greek temples. So, so what is, why is that? Like also our president wants to have marble busts of themselves. So it keeps being this one culture that is really a very small time in world history that is being referenced as the past, as if that was the one touchstone that, that also trying to be repeated both aesthetically, but also politically in a sense, because from that time, there's also a sense that this was actually the time, like the time of the best art, the best politics, the most beautiful bodies, uh, and so on. And, and what I'm interested in in my research is, well, what do we do with all the things from, particularly from ancient Greece, that maybe doesn't fit in? So things that are like a little too obscene, dirty, weird, a little too feminine? Uh, and how have people responded to those things? How are they, they maybe trouble this narrative of us inheriting this ancient, uh, formidable culture? So, so one, one figure, an example of this, of uh, figures that doesn't fit quite into this, this narrative is that I'm writing a book about this, these figurines that were discovered by German archaeologists in Praini, so on the coast of Turkey, um, here. So, um, and she goes by a name of, of Baubo, often, but this is an ancient Greek figure. It's often, she's often described as prehistoric, which actually isn't the case at all. She's from third century BC. But you see this, like when the German archaeologists found this around 1900, they were like, what is going on? Did ancient Greeks make these things? Then, then what, what, what were they doing? Like, what was they thinking? Then it was an idea of Greek sculpture being these marble sculptures of beautiful bodies and then having something that seems so grotesque uh, and overly feminine that like why what is the the use of this or what was the purpose how does that fit into their idea of 
Greek culture, which they do did conceptualize as something very uh, masculine, very uh, proper, very logical and sensical. So I like to show this is a, it's called a view into the prime of Greece. Um, and you see, it's a picture that is like, it's all men, they're all white, they're building this ridiculous temple that is kind of impossible. It's like an inside out temple that you don't even know how many stories it is. It's kind of an, it's a, it's supposed to be Greece, but this is no place in Greece. So this is clearly like a fantasy. So just to say that ancient Greece, especially in this time in, in the 19th century, was both a time and place. It's ancient Greece, but it was also this concept, this idea that you could, that you could emulate and, and, and a very masculine, a very white uh, concept that didn't exist. I mean, that's what I'm interested in, in what, um, uh, how these ideas were, were troubled. And the 20th century, when this whole nation state product uh, or yeah, product is being a disaster with the, with the face of the world war and also in the beginning of the 20th century where mass migration where also more people were moving in yeah. that time than had ever been moving around the world before. And, and suddenly there was a sense that maybe all that we have strived for is, is actually a disaster, that this is also um, both a political, but also an aesthetic artistic turn that like, can we look to a past that isn't this white marble masculine past? And can we use a different past as an inspiration? And, and one thing that a lot of both scholars, archeologists, but also artists did was to look slightly outside what was traditionally Europe. Um, um, and also to look farther back, like what happened before antiquity. One, one excavation that happened around 1900 or starting a little before um, is that of Knossos in Crete, where you have this culture, so a place in Crete that is Greece, it's still very much thought of as Greece, but of course around 1900 is also a time where, where, where actually exactly when this excavation has happened, 1900 to 1920, Crete is also one of the battling points between the Greek nation and uh, the Ottoman Empire that is starting to to crumble. So this is a very, it's a very loaded place in that time of what is Europe, what is Asia, and a lot of politics between the European powers and Ottoman Empire played out on Crete. So so this place becomes also a place to look for what it means to be European because it's not at all obvious that Crete is European. It's also very close to, and I've always had connections to. Um, the Levant, so Syria, and also down south to Africa, to Egypt. But in these excavations, we found in a culture, a Bronze Age culture, so something starting from the Bronze Age is roughly 3000 to 1000 BC, that has a completely different aesthetics than ancient Greece. So you suddenly find these images of much more women uh, being, and also pictures of women taking part in rituals and seemingly taking part in uh, important events, public events, and, and it just seemed to be an idea of this seems to be a very different culture and, and, and one where women have a different status. There's almost no depiction of wars and violence. Um, uh, it's, there's no picture that is obviously of a, of a king or a ruler. There doesn't seem to be this one figure that everyone is focused on. And this become a very charged uh, excavations of thinking of like, maybe this is a completely different society, both from the society we have today, but also from every other ancient society. We kind of just have assumed that every society have had a male head, someone at the top of the pyramid. So, so, so just to give some perspective, if we talk about what we may often think about with ancient Greece, like Plato, the philosophers, the tragedians, that's around 500 BC or the, the fifth century BC. Uh, and this is like a thousand, almost a thousand years before. So, so when the Greeks write the Homeric epic, so the, the, the Trojan War, they are looking back to this older society. They have some vague memory that there was this great civilization that somehow went under. And we also think that it might have been myths like Atlantis, um, like something, this fantastic society that disappeared. That might have also been inspired by this vague memory that there was an even older society that went to a disastrous end. Also because there was a big volcanic eruption that probably had a lot to do with um, the end. But I'll show you, this is one from um, Santorini in Greece. Um, and you see there, I mean, they're very compelling, these images. They're, 
they're some of the most beautiful images I know actually, but you see here these two women, they are gathering uh, saffron, so they're picking crocuses, the flowers, uh, to make saffron of, and this is the type of imagery we have, so people doing probably not everyday thing, there's probably some ritual or some important meaning to it, but we have people that are, it's not just the, um, so the art from, for example, Egypt or from Mesopotamia, um, so in the region of Iraq from the same time, a lot of the art is people bringing tribute to a king. It's a very clear hierarchy of who's in charge, who's um, working for them. And here we have these scenes of people collaborating, doing things together. We don't see obviously that someone is, is the center of attention. Yeah. Um, so another image that's very famous, this one from Knossos uh, in Crete, and we see here there's it's some kind of event like people are gathered, people are looking at something. Um, but one thing you can see that if there, there's no one person who is uh, obviously in a, in, a, in a more privileged position and the people who are seem to be more individualized are these women that you see um, sitting in the middle bands. You see these women sitting and turning, they're kind of in pairs and looking and talking to each other. In Egypt, for example, you would have the pharaoh would be depiction as much bigger than than all other people. Exactly. Like so, there's there's often subtle ways to show hierarchy or who's in charge. But here we have like these scenes of crowd, where if anything, women are the ones that are more individualized, that they seem to have more personalized. That there is some attention to them, but as you say, they're not really the focus of attention by everyone else. Yes. Um, and it's just a very, I mean, they're also very compelling because it gives you, it's easy to picture what this life is. Like we have few cultures where we see such beautiful um, everyday, everyday scenes. Exactly. Um, what happens though is like it is, there's, it's a beautiful place and it's one of the most visited sites in Crete, but the archaeologist who excavated Sir Arthur Evans, who was a brilliant archaeologist, he almost, he was very uh, touched. He was very disturbed by also the, the Greco-Turkish wars that, that were happening and the violence that was happening. And got, it's hard to say how much, but a little wrapped up in this fantasies uh, or in this idea of this culture. So his work on it becomes more and more fantastical. And, and there's a lot of forgeries coming out from this place. Here you have this goddess, so she has these amazing outfit with her breasts out, holding snakes. Um, this is actually three different parts, the sculpture that has been pieced together. She has like a little hat with a cat sitting on her head. That has nothing to do with ancient, that, that belongs to something completely different than just the archeologist who found like, well, that looks neat, I'll just put it on her head. So then she ends up with this little cat hat. Um, so it's become like very much an, a time that is a bit inspiration, but it's a little hard to differentiate about where does uh, the modern reconstruction stop and where does the ancient culture take on? And a lot of it, it is very clearly a society that had a different, probably a different gender roles than, um, than we know from many other societies. Uh, and, uh, and even if they, even if they did have wars, it also, it's, it's uh, striking enough to have a society that doesn't celebrate that, that doesn't show that as their main that is not what they want to make their art about. But it's an interesting thing that also what we go in, what we assume to find in history. I mean, there's been a lot of work, um, backlash in, in archeology span after his excavations to say like, why well, was all fantasy? They were just as violent as any other place. Um, and it's almost, see, it's interesting that there's almost a more urgency to prove that no, like women were not at all like in charge. Like why is it this, because uh, normally when we find statues with, with pictures of men in society from ancient society, we do assume that they were in charge. So it, this also causes us to question, how do we work and why is it so important? Like why does this have to be extra proven before you're allowed to say that, well, maybe women were actually ruling. And, and then one thing that I think interesting and one thing in this project is often that a lot of these ancient sculptures, they are immediately classified as, as goddesses, um, which can be very inspiring and, and empowering, I think, but also a little bit uh, relegate women to this other sphere. <laughs> like, what if she's just a woman in charge uh, instead of being a goddess? Or, and also, like, it's always like one trope that you hear a lot. It's like, there's one goddess. There's just different pictures of one. So like, even if there is one woman in center of attention, it, it can only be one. <laughs> like female.
for example, these artifacts coming out from um, Greece, <clears throat> which are even older, or, or they're, yeah, they're even older from around 3000 BC. And there are these beautiful figures of, of women and they're very simple. Um, and if you think, if you compare this with um, a lot of this, so this, these are started coming out between the 1930s and the 1960s, they're being excavated. It's very hard to know. Uh, there's a lot of illegal excavation. We don't always know where they come from. And a lot of them are probably forgeries because they're pretty easy to make. And if you think this is also a time period in modern art where we have much more abstract art, so cubism. So it's a very hand in hand of this, these being inspirations for, um, uh, for modern art and actually being modern art themselves because they might be forgeries. Hans Ap, so you see this is one of his goddess figurines, yes. um, or people like um, here, Henry Moore in Britain. So, so there's also a lot of artists, not just that they're taking these shapes, but also the motifs. So there is a more interest in doing female figures. Whatever these, these ancient figures are, we interpret them, but they also started producing art, go turning away from maybe the art of the, um, 18th and 19th century, so that type of the, the white pillars and the, the white marble statues and thinking about what else can art be, what can it look like, what can it celebrate, what can it be about. The other site that, that I wanted to, to show you to or talk about is the Çat in um, in Anatolia in Turkey and, and also these images where we have a society this is a very early, this is a Stone Age society. So this is roughly 7,000 BC, so, so way, way before. And this is a time where we don't have many cities or many like, states and, and a very early place where people live together. So one of the earliest that we know of. And we find in this place, in other times where we go and excavate, we expect to find a temple, like a palace, something that is obviously a place of attention or of power, something that is more lavishly decorated, some just looks com more comfortable to live in. And we don't have anything like that. So every house seems to be built. There's a lot of people living together um, and they all seem to be living in roughly same sized houses. And also we found sculptures, both uh, of women and men, we found these fantastic images of really big women and older women too. So you see someone who's yeah, whose skin has been been around for a while, uh, and we we talk about what what are these? Are they are they goddesses? Are they queens? Uh, and even if we don't uh, know exactly, I think it's it's interesting to know enough that this is a society that that values and wants to depict old women, old big women, um, and maybe that also their categories could be different from us. That is not maybe so important that if it's men or women, but maybe, for example, age can be much more important than it is for us, that you want to be celebrated for having a, reached an old age. Um, and one thing that I also would be is that they're often called goddesses, and there's often emphasize of that, well, these goddesses must be goddesses of fertility, of childbirth, which is like, well, that's great, but women do more than, than just that, too. And it's, it's just worth to point out, like, these women look like they're, like, well past that stage. They, they, they did that. For example, in, um, in Egypt. Yeah, so for example, this is the statue from, um, from Egypt. Um, and this is the, a queen that we know had a lot of influence. Like this was in no way a matriarchal society. There was a male pharaoh, a male king. But we know that this queen, Queen Tia, she had a lot of power. She was a lot of influence. So, so foreign kings would ask to like talk to the queen mother. Uh, and you see like this is not how a portrait, this is not what she looked like necessarily. She can choose to be depicted however she wants. But it's worth noting that the way she wants to be depicted is as an older woman, as an old, over middle-aged woman, that that's something she's proud of, like someone who has lines in her face, like someone who has... Um, um, has lived a long life and that that's something to be to be proud of and something that can be the source of her authority and it's a feat <laughs> like it's impressive it's like not very many people get to exactly. to grow old exactly and now we're in a mindset of just internal youth <laughs> exactly yeah so it's a little bit of shame where people were like assume and would again that we just assume that especially women will would only want to be depicted as as young and which is not always at all the
I mean, I'm just, I'm just fascinated with, especially when we talk about the deep past, the prehistoric past, that is when we don't have written sources, where we actually only have images and archaeology to go for. And how like everyone becomes this hobby psychologist and be like, well, this is how humans work. It'd be like, well, if, if we knew how humans work, then it wouldn't be any point of doing archaeology. We, we're doing it to find out. And you'll be like, well, young women have always been like the most sought after because they, they can bring children to the world. Whereas if you actually, as you probably as every midwife will tell you, like the biggest, the best sign for that someone can have a child is that they have already had a child. <laughs> So actually, if you were just wanted like to depict women who would be good child bearers, you would have someone with like, you know, like a body that proved that she had already gone through that. It's so interesting. And it's funny because when you bring it back to today, also this internal use look, it's kind of like what's depicted is like, it's the part where right before you're supposed to be having children, right? And we're so right, exactly. want like this perfect want body or moment that we're stuck in before we produce. For me, at the end of the day, the, the, what is interesting with, with history is it's that it's different. And, and that's also the challenging thing is that it's not, just, it's not just the opposite of what we have. It's not the same, but it's something radically different. And that's also the, what can be so productive with looking with the past. And, and the most difficult is that it's, you really have to try to put in a different mindset than also the most and that's why i think showing these modern artworks i think those that is a result of how looking at the past past actually did change something in the present that had influenced the whole new way of thinking about art and thinking about depicting especially the female body that is was different 100 uh, percent Okay, so thank you so much, Fred, for being here. Um, I think that was just like such a great second episode. Um, it was really kind of, uh, we, get, we got to have like an alternative discourse on the past and just like, especially women's place in the past. Um, if you guys have any more questions, and like I said, this is an open forum. Um, I'm always interested in your comments and questions, especially for uh, Frederica, if you have any questions in um, what her... I mean, again, this is like, she's writing a book, like what she's studying about. So um, she's researching about. So if you have any more questions for her, we can uh, definitely in the comments in the video section, she'll be there to answer. And then we can always continue with a follow-up video too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Phyllis. Thank you.